Good evening, everyone. The empty tomb, a great historical issue, a historical question rather than a philosophical one or a metaphysical one such as, does God exist? It's a historical question, so it's based on historical events and historical facts, which can be investigated and evaluated in the light of all potential explanations. Now we read this in Acts chapter 17 and verses 30 and 31, and you often hear Christadelphian lectures finish with these verses. Acts 17 then says this, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he have appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he have given assurance unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead. So the scripture here makes it emphatically plain from the book of Acts here, that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is not only a historical fact, but most importantly, it's the proof of his return to set up the coming kingdom of God. All of the promises of the scripture and its entire message of hope are utterly dependent upon the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. These two critically intertwined events are the central hinges of all human history because the whole of the Almighty's creative purpose and order pivots upon these two events. Even we in our calendar dating system from 525 AD till relatively recently measured history with these events using the designations BC or before Christ and AD or Anno Domini, the Latin phrase in the year of our Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15 then, in verses 3 to 8, we read these words. For I was delivered unto you, for I delivered unto you the first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. After that he was seen of also about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, that's the apostle Paul, as one born out of due time. Now these words recorded here in 1 Corinthians 15, particularly verses 3 to 5, are regarded as the earliest confessional creed of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, mentioned within the scriptures. Historians, both Christian and non-Christian, date these verses to within a few months of the Lord's death in AD 30 to AD 33. Paul through the Spirit states that he received this tradition which was already in existence when he was converted within two to three years of Jesus's death around AD 35, AD 36. Now it's important to state clearly that no credible historian of the first rank denies the life and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's just far too much credible evidence from both a biblical sense and a non-biblical, that's both Jewish and Gentile sources, for it to be called into question. Even the most sceptical critics and outspoken scholars like Bart Ehrman state he certainly existed as virtually every competent scholar of antiquity, Christian or non-Christian, agrees. So virtually then everyone agrees with the person, the place, the timing of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, and of course with the empty tomb. Likewise, they'll accept that he claimed to have taught certain things, he claimed to allegedly perform miracles, and finally that he's supposed to have rise, risen from the dead. So the only thing in contention then is the empty tomb. What is the most reasonable explanation for the tomb being empty of the Lord Jesus Christ? Now notice carefully here the language that I've used. It's important. I did not say the most possible explanation, but the most reasonable explanation. According to the rules of evidence used in jury trials, almost anything is possible, but not everything is reasonable. So it's the most reasonable explanation 
that takes into account all the evidential factors. Now, basically, there are two types of evidence, direct and indirect evidence. Direct evidence is what we would call eyewitness testimony, and indirect evidence is what is often called circumstantial evidence. Now, it's often assumed by people that these two types of evidence are not of equal value, but legally, actually, they are. Indirect evidence or circumstantial evidence is equally valid, and often in historical cases, this is the only evidence we have to try and come to a reasonable conclusion of what actually took place. Now, there are three other important factors that we must take into account before we examine any evidence for the resurrection and the empty tomb. Firstly, it's not reasonable to be able to answer every question in a completely satisfactory manner. It's not required. Secondly, we must come to the evidence presented with no prior assumptions that rule out where the evidence may actually lead. This includes the concept that there can be an extra or supernatural reason for the tomb being empty, namely that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ actually took place. Now, if we're going to be truly honest in our investigation, that has to remain a possibility. Finally, eyewitness testimony does not need to agree in exactly every detail for it to be valid. In fact, often the differences in the testimony is what renders the testimony valid. From this, we can rest easy that the differences within, for the, within the four gospel accounts with regards to the resurrection provide us with a fuller picture from multiple perspectives. In fact, according to the rules of evidence, it's only in conspiracy theories that eyewitnesses, the eyewitness testimony is found to totally agree. Historically, conspiracies only work with very limited numbers over a very short period of time. Let's give you an example. Chuck Colson was a lawyer involved in the Watergate scandal under the US President, President Nixon in 1974. He went to prison for that, his involvement in that scandal, and in prison he became a Christian. But he gave this testimony out of his Watergate experience. He said, I know that the resurrection is a fact. Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they'd seen Jesus risen from the dead. And then they proclaimed that truth for many years, never once denying it. Every one of them was beaten, tortured, stoned, put in prison. They would not have endured that if it was not true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world at the time and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me the 12 apostles managed to keep alive for over 40 years. That's absolutely impossible. Again, if you come back with me to 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 12 to 17, read these words. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? For if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, we have found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you are yet in your sins. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then you don't have to worry about anything that he said. The issue on which everything hangs is not whether you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. Now, over time, there have been nine possible explanations for understanding the empty tomb. And they are as follows. The disciples went to the wrong tomb. The disciples hallucinated. Jesus had a twin or a doppelganger. The resurrection is a legend that developed over time. The disciples lied and or stole the body. Someone else stole the body. Jesus swooned on the stake and wasn't really dead. Jesus had a spiritual or an existential rather than a physical resurrection. And that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Those are the nine options available to us. Remember, it's not what is possible that is the true test 
but rather what is the most reasonable inference that we can draw from the evidence. Now, most of these possible explanations, my dear friends, we can quickly show through common sense must be disregarded as being unreasonable. Possible, yes, we admit, but unreasonable all the same. So let's look through these nine options. Option one, the disciples went to the wrong tomb. This is simply dispelled by the fact that Joseph of Arimathea put the Lord Jesus Christ in a tomb which he himself owned. If you turn with me to Mark chapter 15, the Gospel of Mark in the 15th chapter. So Mark chapter 15 and verse 43 is where we want to go in. Mark chapter 15 then and verse 43. Joseph of Arimathea, an honourable counsellor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marvelled if he were already dead. And calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. And he brought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in the sepulchre, which was hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulchre. Is it reasonable then that all the women who followed and Joseph and Nicodemus to see where they would lay Jesus' body was mistaken, never mind the two men themselves, to where the tomb was? No, it isn't. We can dispel that one quite easily. How about option two? The disciples hallucinated. Well, this is one of the most popular theories today, but it collapses when we consider that there have been no occurrences within recorded history of mass hallucination. As far as we can currently are aware scientifically, hallucinations are purely individual and cannot be experienced by others. What do we read in 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 5 and 6? We read this. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling asleep. Is it reasonable for us to assume then that over five hundred people at once had the very same hallucination? Well, no it isn't. So that can be dismissed. Option three. Jesus had a twin. This option too is destroyed. By, this, by a simple quotation from 1 Corinthians 15, and that of verse 7, where we read, After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Now James was the half-younger brother of the Lord, who only believed in him after his resurrection. John chapter 7, verses 3 to 5, records this. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples may also see thy works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret that he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world, the world, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Is it reasonable then that his own half-brother was fooled? The simple answer to this is no, it's not reasonable. Okay, option four then. The resurrection is a legend which developed over time. This is another popular theory today, but again, it's utterly baseless once the evidence is examined. All first-ranking historians agree that all four Gospel records were written by AD 95-96, with the Gospel of John being the latest and the others being considerably earlier. With the record through Mark being before AD 50, that's well within 20 years of the life of Jesus Christ. For legends to occur, time is required. The eminent historian of Roman and Greek times, Professor A. N. Sherman White records that the writings of the historian Herodotus furnished a test case for the rate of legendary accumulation. And the tests show that even two generations is too short a time span to allow legendary tendencies to develop and to wipe out the hard core of historical facts. So there just isn't enough time for legend to develop. Is it reasonable for us to understand, my friends, that the resurrection is a myth? No, it is not. So we must discount that option also. How about option five? That the disciples lied or stole the body. Again, the historical evidence does not stake up, stake up. For the Jews, fearing that the disciples would try to steal the body, persuaded Pilate, the Roman governor, 
of Judea to place a guard on the tomb. Matthew 27 and verse 62 records as follows. Now the next day, that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, So we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure unto the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, You have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can, so they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now, according to historians, these tomb guards would have been made up of 16 experienced Roman soldiers if they were Roman. There are some who argue that it was a Jewish guard, but either way, they would have been made, made up of experienced people. The tomb would not only have been sealed, not only with the wax seal, but also with a stone weighing up to two tons. And the wax seal, if broken, would have forfeited the lives of the men guarding it. Matthew 28 and verses 11 to 15 says this. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, See ye, his disciples came by night and stole him while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this, is, this saying is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. But there's another tiny point of evidence here that must be ex explained by someone who stole the body. And it's recorded for us in the gospel given through John. If you'd like to come to John chapter 20 with me. John chapter 20 and the first eight verses, where we read this. So John 20 verses 1 to 8. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene, early when it was yet dark until the sepulchre, and seeing the stone taken away from the sepulchre, then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto him, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came to the sepulchre first. He stooping down looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre. And seeing the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself, then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. And the question is this, why would anybody stealing the body remove the grave clothes, and neatly fold them up, and place them in the grave? Never mind the hundred pound weight of spices he was wrapped in. Is it reasonable for us to believe? that they stole the body and lied about it after the claiming it was a resurrection and went to their deaths for that belief. No, it is not. So we must discount, discount this one as well. You see, my dear friends, men will die for all sorts of beliefs, but they'll never die for something they know to be a lie. That would be insanity, like hallucination. It is unreasonable to believe that they all suffered from it at the same time. Option number six then, someone else stole the body. Now the problem with this option is that once the faith took off, as it does in the early chapters of the book of Acts, with many Jews coming to the faith and with the Jewish leaders beside themselves frantically trying to stop this new religion, anybody who had the body would just be able to produce it and kill the movement dead in its tracks. And undoubtedly they would greatly profit from the Jewish leaders who would gladly pay for the body. Plus, it's very difficult to come up with a motive for anybody else other than the possibility of the disciples wanting to steal the body. Let us remember that anybody trying to do this would have to overcome the stone and the Roman guards and the fact that Jesus was wrapped in a hundred pound of spices and so forth. Is it reasonable for us to believe that somebody else stole the body and then never reproduced it? I think not. So we must discount that option as well. How about option seven? Jesus swooned on the stake. Again, this is a very popular option, but it only needs a single point of evidence to refute it. If you still have your Bibles open at John 20, in John 19 and verse 31, we read these words. 
And the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain on the state on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was on high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the leg of the first, and then of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith there came out blood and water. And he saw, and he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. Now the blood and the water pouring out of the side of Jesus after being pierced by a spear is medically called a pleural effusion, which is a buildup of water on the lungs. This is a result of dying of a broken heart upon the state. Now this was a medical fact that was not known until the late 1800s. And there is more medical evidence that we could raise here. Never mind the fact how could he get out of a hundred pound of cement like spices tightly wrapped around his body, roll away the stone, pass the guard without being noticed. Is it reasonable for us to believe, given all the torture and everything Jesus went through, he'd been up all night, he'd had to carry the stake, he had been beaten, and so forth, that he was not truly dead when he went into the tomb. In fact, even the fact that an experienced centurion who manned the crucifixion squad attested to the fact he was dead. To Pilate. Of course it's not reasonable at all, so we must discount that as an option. How about option A? Jesus had a spiritual or an existential rather than a physical resurrection. Of all the theories this is the easiest one to refute because all the, G the Jews needed to do was to produce the body. If there was no bodily resurrection, and of course they could not because the tomb was empty and everyone knew it. Again, the scriptures themselves refute this. In the Gospel through Luke, we read this, Luke 24 and verses 33 to 43. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together. And them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and have appeared to Simon. And they told them what things were done in the way, how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do these thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy, and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. Is it reasonable for us then to believe that Jesus had a spiritual or an existential resurrection when the scripture clearly teaches it was bodily? No, it is not. Well, my dear friends, that only leaves us with the final option, however improbable it may seem. But let me remind you what we said at the beginning. You cannot remove the possibility of an extra natural or supernatural explanation, if that's where the evidence leads. Remember, it's what's the most reasonable explanation for the tomb being empty. And it is this, that Jesus actually rose from the dead. It's the only solution that makes the best fit of all the evidence concerned. Remember, for this to be true, it does not require us to be able to explain every possible question that arises. Only that it fits the evidence best. It's the best explanation for the results. Let's just take two simple lines of thought that could be greatly expanded upon. Firstly, the lasting effect of that one solitary life of Jesus Christ. How do you explain it if there is no resurrection? The societal transformation due to the influence of Christianity over the next 2000 years, right across the globe, how do you explain it? There's no way to explain it, except for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that makes sense. Equally, the transformational effect of those truths in people's lives, firstly in the immediate disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, who were scared and in hiding after the death of Jesus, but after his resurrection, were completely bold and completely compelled to turn the world upside down, as the scripture declares. 
But also, and all those who follow him today, people like myself, and all those in between who have believed. This is what gives the gospel relevance today. How do you explain that if the resurrection is not true? Well, our time has nearly gone, so I hope I've managed to show you the centrality of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one question that really needs to be investigated for somebody to come to a fair conclusion about whether biblical Christianity is actually objectively true. And that is this fact, did Jesus rise from the dead? And the answer affirmatively, affirmatively is yes. Let's give another witness. Anthony Flew, the greatest atheist of the 20th century, at least in UK terms, the great mentor for Richard Dawkins, towards the end of his life, changed his mind because of the work of the Catholic biologist Michael B. with regards to the intricacies of the, hu of the cell. The evidence for intelligent design was just too great and the man's intellectual honesty demanded that change. Now it must be stated that Flew never became a Christian as he died still exploring the possibility of it. But he did come to believe in a God now he had the following to say on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The evidence for the resurrection is better than that claimed for in miracles in any other religion. It is outstandingly different in both quality and quantity. The question that faces us all here today, my friends, is this. Do you and I have the intellectual courage of flu to go where the evidence leads? If you'd like to turn back to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, where we started, let, let me remind you that this is used as a proof for that which is yet to come upon the earth in the kingdom of God at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30 says this, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he have appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whom he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he raised him from the dead. This is the proof that makes all this viable. That which we say about the coming kingdom of God, that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, that makes the coming kingdom of God inevitable. And our earnest prayer and wish for each one of you, my friends, is that you will take hold of the Almighty's offer of salvation. You will avail yourself not only of the hope, but more importantly, of the peace of mind that comes for a belief and an acceptance of the gospel message. And wait for the coming kingdom of God alongside us. Thank you for listening.